Hello, I'm Brian Hubbard. And I'm Lynn McTaggart. And we are What Doctors Don't Tell You. And welcome to another podcast and vlogcast. And Lynn, tell us a bit about, we're still mid current issue so it's still available in the store lynn's now holding it up my able assistant <laughs> and, <laughs> and you can buy it in stores right across america and the uk we print and distribute simultaneously as if a miracle of modern production right across the us and and the, the uk and um lynn do you, what's, what's in this issue if i haven't got it already well, Brian, I'd also like to add that mm. we're not only in the U.S. and the U.K., mm. but we are in 15 other languages around the world now. So Sacre bleu. The, the message is spreading. No, no, I don't know. That's not what no. doctors oh, don't right. tell it's you in French, okay. but they're no. all much longer than yeah. English. Yeah. Anyway, in this issue this month, we've got an amazing story, as we told you last time, about uh, depression. We have a, 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 a psychiatrist who has basically gone on record to say there's no such thing as mental illness, that everything happens much further upstream. It may be your gut, it may be allergies, it may be something else, but that's causing your low mood or a host of other so-called mental illnesses. And she gets people well by sorting those things out. So take a look at it. It's really, this is really great story. And there's also fantastic stuff in, in here about, um, about the truth about carbs and healing hay fever and loads more as there are every issue. Fantastic. Lynn. And if you don't get hold of a copy in the store, subscribe. And you can do so quite easily by going to our website, which is www.wddty.com. So it's wddty.com. And where you can subscribe, and we'll send you the issue every month, post-haste. Great. And we've got a new one coming up oh. soon. This is a sneak preview. Mm. It's for anybody who's been told they need a hip replacement, why you should check this out first. Um, Dr. Mitchell Yaz who is a really experienced physical therapist, is a man on a mission. He is trying to get people who have been told they need a hip or a knee replacement or any other joint replacement to try some exercises first. Because what he finds, Brian, is that it's not your hip, it's a muscle imbalance mm. that is causing your pain in most in most cases. And he gets people well in weeks mm. wow. and pain-free. So check this out. We've got a story about essential oils killing chronic Lyme disease and much, much more. Yeah, it's always a good issue, folks, and this one looks particularly good. This is going to be available, I think, from the end of April. End of April. Um, but there, you, you have a sneak preview of that. But again, plenty of time to subscribe, and we, we can get that in the post to you as well. And so by the way, you're mm. the... Uh, slightly older eagle-eyed mm. people will mm. recognize that mm. that image on the front yeah. is John Cleese in Monty Python, the mm. Ministry of Silly Walks. There you go. So it's we a want cultural to... reference that surprisingly few people get. <laughs> but there you are. Thanks very much, Lynn. <laughs> was just talking a moment ago about the next issue coming out in, in the stores. And there was a Cunning and good reason for doing so, Lynn, wasn't there? Because there's a very special feature we have in that upcoming issue on 5G, the new Internet of Things. It's 5G is reckoned to be about a hundred times faster than the current 4G cell mobile phone network, but it's meeting some resistance. And uh, one uh, case in point is the city of Brussels because that's the first European city that's actually blocked the rollout of the new 5G network because they're not happy that it, that it is entirely safe. And uh, 21 city-states, local government authorities in the states, have already done something similar because they are so concerned about the health hazards that 5G represents. The um, city... Um, 
Brussels City uh, Environment Minister Celine Fremeau uh, said, uh, the people of Brussels are not guinea pigs whose health I can sell at a profit, which is certainly reassuring news because thus far, the uh, 5G network licences have been flogged in the UK for about a few billion pounds. And similar sums are being uh, achieved in the US with already only just half the licences being issued. So there's enormous money involved in this. And yet again, people's health is a secondary consideration. And because although the was interesting, the 5G network, although it's much faster, it's actually weaker. And that means that the operators are going to have to put in so many more masts just to get the things connecting up. And those are cell towers, by the way, in yes. the States. cell towers, yes. Thanks, Lynn. Cell towers, cell towers masks. Uh, many more are going to be installed. And there's already a uh, ruling in place in America that prevents anyone from appealing against this. You cannot appeal because... Uh, because there's money, guys. And, um, <laughs> there's and, too much money and There's too much money. And um, no, there's no reasonable grounds that you can raise. And of course, it becomes a vicious circle because you can't object on health grounds because they say there's no evidence that there's any health problems with it. And that's the point, though. The In the EU, there are, there's 200 scientists, and we mentioned this in the next article, are appealing against the 5G rollout on that very ground, that because it's not proven to be safe, it should not be rolled out. And it's what is known as the precautionary principle. If it's not safe, don't do it. And if it's not proven to be safe, don't do it. Because once the genie is out of the bottle, you can't get it back. And I think that's the concern they're all having. Said so We must prove that 5G is safe with independent studies, which means not studies paid for, by the cell phone industry, because all of those studies, believe it or not, have demonstrated that cell phones, mobile phones, and the networks are perfectly safe. The small number of studies that have been carried out that are independent beg to differ. And so I think, you know, it really does need to be a full, comprehensive, well-funded study into all of this before any of this rolls out. Because, you know, we're talking here about they're talking about cancer, causing cancer, brain tumours. And, you know, we, you know they're, they're, I don't know, every time we come about this, Lynn, don't we? It's always profits before people, whether it's in health or anything else or, or in terms of, of, of farm produce, now in terms of telecoms, it's always profit before people. Absolutely. And, I mean, this has been the, uh, the essentially the the way that all of the mobile phone, cell phone industry has been dealt with since its inception. There's been this assumption that we don't have to prove that it's safe because it is safe. Mm -hmm. And they have blocked many a time, they have blocked the um, uh, voices that are objecting. Like George Carlos in the States has taken a lot of stick. He's mm. one scientist who keeps hammering on about the dangers of cell phones mm. and that they are responsible for a very good percentage of uh, gliomas, the rise of gliomas, which mm. are very fast growing brain cancers. But here we are entering into a whole new realm you know, I every so often I get a letter from somebody who is so sensitive to these radio frequency waves that they can't escape. Somebody wrote recently and he just said, I, you know, I can't live, I can't work anymore, I've had mm. to quit my job, I can do the odd work at home, mm. but I just can't leave any my house mm. because I'm so sensitive to smart meters. Right. So all of these things, smart meters, cell phones, and now this 5G technology, which you, as you say, means a cell, a cell tower, uh, you know, every, every couple of blocks. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it, that's very frightening. Yeah. And the big difficulty is the countries that don't admit it. I mean, there are plenty of other countries that do. I mean, France, for instance, has banned cell phones in schools mm. because they believe there's enough evidence to show that it hurts growing brains. Yeah, and is that's really for the under-12s? 
And I think that is the particular concern that as a developing brains are particularly vulnerable to these um, radiation levels. And um, yes, you're right. They've banned uh, Wi-Fi as well mm -hmm. from uh, primary schools, from junior schools, whatever you call them, in France. And, um, you know, I, there must be something in it for them to do that. Absolutely. So what do you do with this? You shout loudly about it, basically. Mm -hmm. um, before 5G can get put into your state, if there are enough states that are objecting to something, it will, and passing laws against it. The demos, there's been a lot of evidence demonstrating that once that happens, th that creates a critical mass that moves it into federal law territory. Great. So just keep, just keep objecting Great. until it's proven to be safe. Well, on the subject of cell phones, masks, and radiation, there's an interesting story that comes out of uh, California where parents are blaming a cell tower for a sudden rise in cancer cases among students and teachers. It's at an elementary school in Ripon, San Joaquin in California. And um, four students and three teachers have developed cancer in the past four years, and it seems to coincide with the installation of the cell tower itself. And certainly this is this level of cancers amongst relatively young people, and I include teachers in that, is way beyond what you would expect in the national average. So therefore they're saying, surely the cell tower must be to blame. Uh, the district authority answer sure because they're getting two thousand dollars a month from sprint which put the cell tower up in the first place so the um, parents are feeling rather sort of hopeless really about it all they don't know where to turn because no one seems to be that interested in their concerns um especially as this two thousand dollars seems to be flying around and um but they're nonetheless mounting campaigns to get it removed. Um, so we're not sure where this is going to go, but I think what would be interesting to hear from listeners and viewers is whether they're seeing similar patterns at their school if they happen to have a cell tower on the school, in the school or nearby. I mean, because um, what schools also often do is have a cell tower erected on the roof because it brings in extra money for them. So, yeah, I'd be interested to hear, Lynn, uh, whether or not we're seeing more cases of cancer amongst kids and amongst teachers, which is above the national average, and see if there's a correlation between those cases and the cell tower. Absolutely. And people keep talking about the fact that there's no evidence. There is a lot of evidence. I mean, there's a lot of evidence done on animal research, which, of course, doesn't necessarily apply to humans. But it gives you an indication that this stuff isn't good for living things. Mm. And uh, they have shown a connection between um, cell phone radiation and uh, brain cancer in animals. Mm. Mm. And there's more and more demonstrations of these kind of hot spots where uh, a, a higher amount than normal of people are getting brain cancer, particularly mm. children, when there's a cell phone tower nearby. Mm. Okay. And uh, one of the parents said that her doctor who diagnosed the cancer in her son said that it was definitely caused by something in the environment. He didn't quite go so far as to say it was the cell tower, but it was an environmental cancer. So, you know, three guesses, guys. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Lynn. Measles, the dread disease that the world wants to eradicate, led by the World Health Organization, who have been trying to set targets to remove the measles virus from the human race within a few years. And of course, they've had setbacks because the vaccine levels have not been met, the MMR, particularly in developed Western countries. And as a result, of course, there's been a backlash this year against the anti-vaxxers who are stopping the, uh, the uptake of the vaccine. But maybe they shouldn't be quite so quick to get the measles virus eradicated because researchers at Mayo Clinic, a very prestigious clinic, I should say, have been using the measles virus to kill cancer. 
And um, in fact, there was it was a human trial. It was a woman who had end-stage cancer. Um, and um, she, they really didn't know what to do. She really was on, uh, had weeks to live. Um, and so they decided to uh, give her this enormous dose of, of uh, the measles, measles virus. It was an enormous dose, to be fair. It was enough to vaccinate 10 million people. So it was a ginormous dose of measles for her multiple myeloma. But within 36 hours of having that dose, a golf ball-sized tumour on her face had disappeared completely. And within a few weeks, her cancer had disappeared. Uh, it's a, the therapy is, 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 is quite well known in medical circles. It's called virotherapy. It's not well used, but it is well known. And um, they, they say that, you know, there is a natural thing about cancer, that, about measles killing, uh, killing cancer, and it probably is because of what it's doing is to stimulate the immune system. And uh, that is what seems to be working in this case. And they said, look, the Mayo Clinic uh, researchers say, look, this is definitely a, a, an ethical and uh, a provable uh, way forward in the treatment of cancer. So, um, I mean, it, it, this has been backed up by University College London, not exactly slouches themselves in terms of good research, and they agree. And in fact, they even did a paper called Measles to the Rescue and saying that this, these are serious contenders in cancer treatment and that the vaccine strain of measles virus holds special hope in the fight against cancer. So, you know, it goes back a bit, doesn't it, Lynn, to you know, parents always saying, well, my kid had measles and it built their immune system and it made them stronger and better as a result. And this is sort of an extension of that. I mean, this is multiple times the sort of level of measles that kids would get naturally. But there is something about the virus that really does, I suppose, stimulate the immune response and is killing cancer. And I mean, there's a, there's a danger, isn't there, that if we do completely eliminate the virus, that we'll lose what actually could be a natural defender for us. Well, we see this with a lot of areas now in health. Uh, where parents are trying to protect their children from viruses and bacteria on the idea that this, you know, this is good for them. But they found with the hygiene hypothesis, for instance, when children are kept away from bacteria or playing in dirt or whatever, they oftentimes develop many more allergies than kids that are allowed outside and to play normally um, who are exposed to much more of this. Mm. And the same probably has to do with these so-called childhood diseases, mm. which probably, which in well-nourished children don't kill them. Mm. Measles is not dangerous in well-nourished children with adequate levels of vitamin A, mm. even children in Africa who are starving. If they get measles and they're given vitamin A, they usually don't die. Mm. So, uh, so this is a case of us messing around with the ecology of nature where we really don't completely understand what we're doing. I mean, various researchers have, have looked at giving people some sort of toxin. Coley gave this thing called Coley's toxins in order to induce a fever mm. and found that the fever was and the toxins were creating an immune system response that was killing cancer. So the same thing goes here. Mm. And it is worth saying, too, by the way, that um, these epidemics of measles happen indiscriminately, and they oftentimes occur among the vaccinated. So this idea that it has to do with a lessening of herd immunity is nonsense. It just breaks through. Mm. You know, viruses are very clever, and they break through. Mm. So, And vaccines aren't perfect. So I think this is before we demonize measles, as we've continued to do, and think about this being a really great thing to eradicate. Why don't we just give people in developing countries vitamin A so they stop dying from measles and look into this for, further as an amazing cancer mm. cure? Yeah, because measles is a killer amongst the malnourished, really, isn't it, Lynn? Yeah, exactly. And, and you look into the West where we do get the nutrients we need in the main, in those cases, it is a relatively benign disease. And yet 
what the World Health Organization and Bill Gates Foundation all they seem to be doing is lumping everyone together and mm. saying, well, measles is a killer, which is, yes, but amongst the malnourished. And I think yeah. you know, that has to be the real point, isn't it? And um, we, 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 we seem to have wrapped this up in this enormous emotional discharge against the so-called anti-vaxxers, saying, how can you stop this wonderful protective thing against a killer virus, when really that's not really the question we should be asking. And we should start telling the truth. You know, well, is what is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what yeah, is, yeah. you know, a, what, how many people does it actually kill? in the West, among well-nourished children. Mm. Even in the West, those children who do die from measles are generally malnourished or mm. have some sort of immune compromise. Mm. So we should really be, the point should be, World Health Organization and health authorities should be concerned more about educating people about eating well and being nutritionally strong and making sure they get vitamin A in particular Mm -hmm. to ward off and make this disease a benign disease. Absolutely. And and let's get some more research. If this is a cancer cure, how brilliant. Yeah. And now news of the blindingly obvious. <laughs> uh, Big Pharma has bought Congress. Now, I'm not saying that, although I could do, but an FDA chairman has said that. Um, it's, uh, and there is quite an interesting roll call of recipients. Big Pharma, pharmaceutical industry, is the biggest uh, donator to political causes around the world. It has the most advanced and sophisticated lobbying system around the world. And, you know, greasing the, the, greasing the wheels of power is part and parcel of the modus operandi of the pharmaceutical industry. And um, a, a group called Open Secrets has listed the top recipients of um, the drug company Largess in, uh, in Congress. And uh, Paul Ryan, former House Speaker, received $222,000 in one year, most of it coming from Merck. And even Democrat presidential hopeful Beto O'Rourke received $171,000. So the Democrats aren't immune to having, having a helping hand. Um, but uh, really what's the, the whistleblower in all this is, believe it or not, Dr. Rayford Brown, chair of the uh, FDA's Analgesics and Anesthetics Committee, who says that how could we ever get any change in pharmaceutical industry, in medicine, if Congress is being paid? by Big Pharma? How can they be independent arbiters of the pharmaceutical industry or indeed of the FDA itself if they're getting this money? Of course, of course we know the drugs industry also happens to pay for the FDA. So it's, uh, it's, it's hard to see how change is ever going to happen then. We've got an election looming, but is anything going to be any different, I wonder? Well, this is... This is such evidence of the corruption that mm. riddles most of the American government. I mean, we know that, as you say, the FDA is kind of funny that the pot's calling the kettle black because the FDA is not only funded by the pharmaceutical industry, and literally so because Congress has lowered the funding that that goes to the FDA mm. and allows it to be funded by private industry. But also many of the people in the FDA are former drug company employees. Right. So they have essentially bought and paid for the regulatory agency that's supposed to police them. Um, there's evidence of bias like that in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And of course, now we have Congress um, it's so expensive to run yeah. to be a, a national yeah. candidate yeah. that you have to yeah. um, you have to rely on the big pocketed donors, yeah. and one of the biggest and deepest pockets, of course, is the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah. So you know the way around it. Well, it's very interesting that people like Jennifer Lawrence have joined forces with an organization um, that is anti-corruption and their whole platform is to move this decision making to the state level 
so that if they can get enough states to pass anti-corruption legislation, it will have to be accepted by the federal government. And also the states rule how people get elected so they can yeah. enact tougher laws. Yeah. So I think what we're really talking about, Brian, to try to clean this stuff up is an overhaul of mm-hmm. the way we do business in government. Yeah. Well, it, it has to be that you don't need to have 10, 20, 30 million dollars in order to run for president or indeed for any office of state. And that is possible because one mm. candidate who's never taken anything from the pharmaceutical industry is Bernie Sanders. Mm-hmm. And certainly in the last presidential election, he did not. He relied on small donors mm-hmm. and he's raised an enormous amount of has. money. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But, you know, it's just so far you can go. And, you know, money needs to be dis- disconnected from the political process so that you know, honest folk could come through and be honest brokers once they are in, in positions of power. Because, yeah, yeah, I mean, with the last election, I mean, Hillary Clinton got a lot of money from the pharmaceutical industry. So if Democrats were hoping she was going to be the change agent once she became president, uh, we'll have to think twice because that isn't going to happen, guys. You're not, you know, the, the, she has to reward the, the, the people who, who, who pay her and she isn't going to turn her back on that. So there isn't going to be any change. No, it's I mean, some of the new candidates coming forward have pledged not to accept any money from Big Pharma. And I think it's really going to be that plus these kinds of moves to bring election laws and tighter election laws at the state level that's Mm. going to move things. But I think you're seeing a younger generation that are really looking at the corrupt system, the broken system and saying, we've got to do things differently. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Okay, uh, non-news of the week, part two. Drugs are dangerous. <laughs> they cause adverse reactions, right? And it's the fourth major cause of death in the West of drugs properly prescribed. And these are of deaths that are recorded. And most deaths actually are not recorded. But, you know, there's an even... There's another angle to this as well, which has just come to light. Not only are drugs dangerous because of the, they are chemical agents that cause adverse reactions in people anyway, they also contain allergens that can affect people who are sensitive to them and can be life-threatening. So if you're, you know, if you're allergic to peanut oil, lactose, gluten, or chemical dyes, well, guess what? the drug you're taking could well contain one of these ingredients. Um, Researchers from Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, carried out some research after they heard of a case who was a celiac, uh, who had celiac disease, which is very, very life-threatening sensitivity to gluten, and who was actually taking a drug unwittingly that contained gluten. So they said, well, let's... um, find out how common a problem this is. So they tested 42,000 prescription pills and found that between them they contained a total of 354,000 so-called inactive ingredients, which happened to be allergens. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that these things always get recorded. They probably get bunched under the term inactive ingredient left at that without pointing out that if you're sensitive to any of these things, you know what? It could kill you. Um, Lactose was the most common ingredient they found, which is in 45% of drugs they tested. So if you're lactose intolerant, you really do need to find the the small print or, or find out somehow or another whether the drug you're taking contains lactose. And 33% of the drugs contained a food dye. And um, fortunately, just 33 d- drugs of, of the 42,000 tested actually contain peanut oil. But if you're allergic to peanuts, that's enough to kill you. Mm-hmm. So there you are, Lynn. Drugs just got more dangerous. Well, this isn't surprising because I think the, both the pharmaceutical industry and the medical, conventional medical industry, i.e. doctors, don't really learn a lot about allergens. Mm. And maybe they know about the big ones like peanut allergies, but they don't factor in 
the number of people who are not just uh, allergic to this stuff in the sense of a life-threatening reaction, but also the ones who will just feel unwell mm. from being exposed to this stuff. And that's mm. people who are just intolerant of this, of wheat, for instance. So taking a drug on an ongoing basis, and so many of the drugs are on an ongoing basis, can leave somebody feeling worse off than they did before yeah. and not knowing why. Yeah. Thinking it's yeah. the medicine, uh, it's the yeah. condition when it's actually the medicine. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. It's an important point anyway. And I think if you are starting to take a prescription drug and suddenly you develop a symptom, whatever it might be, insomnia, muscle ache or whatever, suspect the drug. Mm -hmm. Because a doctor may say, well, it's not recorded as being a problem, so it's probably not the drug. But then most side effects are not recorded or adverse reactions are not recorded. And if the, the all the ingredients of a drug are not listed, then how would you know that it's not the drug? So, I mean, you can take that sort of view and say, well, this happened within days of me starting this drug. So, you know, eliminating everything else, it probably was the drug. Yes. And, and I think, you know, you do need to say to the doctor, look, I need to change the medication. Because it's it, it probably is, and I don't care that you think it's not, because it mm -hmm. is. Because doctors don't always know best, do they, Lynn? And we've been Absolutely. pointing out for about 30 years now. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, well, look, I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, and we've come to the end of your patience, no doubt. So thank you for listening. So, um, and check us out at www.wddty.com. And um, I'm Brian Hubbard, and I'll see you again soon. I'm Lynn McTaggart. Don't forget to have a look at our latest issue on depression and why it's not mental. And the next one, sneak preview, why you don't need a hip replacement. Thanks. And by Thank the you. way, we've, we've changed the background here. You may have noticed, but it looks like someone's peering over my shoulder. I can assure you it is not a representative from Big Pharma. But there we are. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.